this lesson, we are going to look at vicarious liability. This topic is actually a good example to showcase the versatility of the law of tort, how widespread it is. Vicarious liability deals with the liability imposed on an employer in relation to the acts of a purported employee. So as such, we have to determine two primary indicators. One, whether the person who has committed the tort is in fact an employee of the defendant. Secondly, we have to look at whether the person who has committed the tort did so while in the course of employment. Now, both of these elements require substantial thinking and a lot of case law and theory to go into before it can be established that a person is in fact an employee. But it can be summarized in quite simple manner. So we'll look at each element separately. First of all, we have to determine whether the person who has committed the tort is in fact an employee of the defendant. Now, the old law was to determine if the person who has committed the tort was in fact under the control of the defendant, of his employer. However, with the progression of time, this was felt to be quite flawed because, for instance, take uh, an IT technician or an IT manager in a contemporary company. He or she might have more knowledge about what he or she is doing in relation to his subject matter than his employer. So it was felt flawed because the employee knew more than the employer in some occasions. So the aspect of control was loosely based. As such, the test now is seen in ready mix concrete and the Minister of Pensions. There are several elements that we have to look at in order to determine if a person is in fact an employee of the defendant. For instance, there are indicators such as the work is being conducted for payment, but this is in itself not conclusive because it might be a contracted party. Secondly, you can also look at the control aspect, much like the old law. And a new element, which is if the employment contract also stipulates that the person is an employee, that might suggest that he in fact is. But this is not conclusive as seen in Ferguson and Dawson where employment contracts might be quite vague and it might infer that he's, he or she is an employee when in fact he or she is not. Regardless of whatever the tests currently employed are, in Hall and Lorimer, what we see is that if the defendant was working on his own account, he cannot be considered an employee. Now, what can we understand from this? Very simply, it must be the fact that he himself should have acted in relation to the betterment of someone else. Now, we'll look at this when we consider course of employment, but it is vital to understand this now because it's one of the mechanisms to figure out if a person was in fact an employee. Another can be seen in Carmichael and National Power. If there is no disciplinary action that can be taken by the defendant, in this case the employer, then most probably the person who committed the tort is not an employee. So if you cannot be punished, if you cannot be fired, if you cannot be reprimanded or fined by your employer, that necessarily means that there might not be as great a control over you as might be the case if you were an employee. So you might be a contracted party. Another interesting case and an interesting principle that can be employed, pun intended, can be seen in Mercy Docks and Coggins. Now all of these cases are available in your case summaries. Have a look at them. They'll elucidate more on these facts. But what Mercy Docks stated very briefly was, if only the employee was lent, then the hirer would be liable and not the employer of this party. However, if the employee was lent along with equipment, it means that there is more liability and more responsibility needed, and that would suggest that the original employer is liable. Now, out of context, this might seem quite confusing, but once you go through the entire case law, as well as the theory outlined here, you get a better understanding. But the bottom line here is that it must be determined if the person who has committed the actual tort is an employee or not. And all these tests, the mechanisms by which we are trying to figure that out, is to establish liability in relation to the employer. Of course, as seen in Lister and Ramford, the employer can later claim from the employee for whatever damages that accrued due to its tort. The next element that we have to look at is whether 
the employee was in the course of employment during the actual tort. Now the original test here is called the Salmon test and it can be seen quite clearly outlined in Lister and Hesley, Hesley Hall. What it stipulates is if it was an authorized wrongful act or an authorized act in an unauthorized way, the employer, in this case the defendant, would be liable. Have a look at Lister and Hesley Hall in the case summaries. It will make things a bit more clearer as to the Salmon test. As always, there are a couple of exceptions to determine before we move on. First of all, if in fact the act which was committed by the employee is expected in the job, as in Mattis and Pollock, then the defendant employer will be liable. Have a look at Mattis and Pollock. It's an interesting case in relation to a club. You would understand why the sort of criminal act involved was expected in the job of the defendant. There are instances in which an employer, in this case the defendant, might have expressly prohibited something being done by the employee, in which case it would be unfair, unjust and unreasonable to impose liability on an employer for the acts of his or her employee. However, in Rose and Plenty, it was stated that if whatever prohibitory act which was mentioned by the employer furthers the business of the employer and yet leads to a tort being committed, the employer would still be liable. If not, as in Twine and Beans Express, the defendant employer would not be liable. One of the most interesting areas or one of the most interesting exceptions in the course of employment is frolics of their own. In essence, what it means is, generally, a defendant employer will not be liable for his employee's acts outside of the course of employment. However, there have been instances where even while they have been out of bounds of the course of employment, court has stipulated or court has held that an employer would be liable, as in Watman and Pearson. However, after work, this is not the case, and the employee is completely out of the bounds of his course of employment with the employer, as in Story and Ashton. Versatility aside, vicarious liability provides a great opportunity for argument, even in an examination situation, 